After studying this module, you shall be able to know the forensic anthropology in case of mass disasters. You will learn about various individualizing characteristics. You will able to identify the victims of mass disaster. A mass disaster is usually recognized as any event in which there is a sudden occurrence of large number of deceased individuals. One usually think of plane and train crashes. However, more recently, the events of 9-11 have added terrorist attacks to forensic anthropology for collecting the consciousness. Large number of dead may also occur in industrial accidents and of course conflicts, natural disasters such as earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, forests and brush fires and even alvinages can produce a large number of dead in a short period of time. One of the most challenging aspects of mass disaster scene processing is the coordination of resources in an efficient manner. The identification of a human remains from mass fatalities is largely accomplished using dental remains. This task is made somewhat easier if there is some record of occupants of a building or even a crashed aircraft. The implication of having some form of manifest is that there is a list of potential candidates and hopefully associated mental or dental records. Logistically, the task is now to sort the remains and determine the identity. Fragmentary human remains undergo an inventory and cataloging process in order to reconstitute individuals with recovered anatomical structures. The charring of human remains in these events tend to be uneven. In cases of aircraft, crashes and fires, jet fuel will act as a very fast burning and extremely hot accelerant. Cremation of remains to the point of calcination may occur, but it is more likely that the body will burn differentially. Of course, there are instances in which a body will be engulfed by a fire and subjected to explosive forces. However, the differential cremation of a body at a mass disaster scene is a real possibility. Aircraft crash victims are usually identified through the use of recovered dental structures. Example is given by Bursley. As noted, the challenge of any mass fatality incident in the documentation and collection of remains. Although the separation of remains from other materials may be time consuming. The process of identifying remains is a challenging task due to the cremated state. Neometric features have been suggested by Staton and Biotti in 1999 to be the only means possible for the identification of cremation. Sex and age may be assigned to cremation should the morphological feature be present to do so. In addition to these clinical x-ray comparison, even associated personal effects can be of importance in the identification process. It is clear from the foregoing that the condition of cremains in the mass disaster scenario is of paramount importance to the identification process. One must be open to the use of many analytical avenues in order to pursue a positive identification. It is Equally clear that a team approach to the identification of disaster victims, particularly when cremated, will enhance the chances of arriving the identification. Now student, let us learn about search and recovery. There are many techniques depending on the type of incident like explosion, air crash, building collapse or mass graves. Forensic anthropologists are widely familiar with the various search procedures implemented in their routine work. This is of great value when choosing the search method for a specific incident. In surface recovery of remains, the teams can either use grid, circle, strip or zone methods or combination of these methods as given by Haunters in 1996, Tuller and Homesto and Delhi in 2008. The method selected will depend on the train to be searched. In collapsed structures, trained cadaver dogs are instrumental in locating human remains. 
Once the remains are located and properly documented, their prompt recovery and transportation to the mortuary are of paramount importance. Identification of the remains at the scene, although tempting to the noise, will inevitably lead to the confusion and should be avoided under any circumstances. The appropriate recovery and documentation technique are imperative in reassociation of body parts and personal belongings. In forensic investigation, the search are performed to locate Kedalston burials, bodies deposited on the surface, body parts, skeletal elements or bones and associated evidences. At the same time, searches can also be utilized in clearing the areas so investigation can continue in additional suspected areas. Before conducting a research, a search plan should be formulated that identifies the personal and equipment that will be needed and specific search techniques that will be used. Now let us see the determination of number of individuals in case of mass disaster. Once the human remains are brought to designated work area, forensic anthropologists lead the process of identification and reassociation of fragmentary bodies. Determining the number of individuals present within the remains is the first step in mass disaster. The possibility of commingling should be considered whenever body parts are discovered over a wide area. Prior to the direct examination of body parts, imaging of body bags containing the remains either by conventional radiography or 3D computer tomography is recommended. The anthropologist focuses or identifying anatomical structures, unique individualizing features and pathological finding in osseosis remains. Separation of commingled remains into a discrete individual is accomplished through morphological examination. The individuals can be sorted according to their anthropological profile and the possibility of accurate articulation. Now let us see the use of anthropological profile in mass disaster. The nature of mass disaster often rendered to the victims in fragmentary condition or badly decomposed due to protected recovery. The preparation of anthropological profile is a prerequisite to achieving a positive identification, developing on anthropological profile and tiles estimation of age, sex, ancestry, race and structure of a particular individual through the interpretation of skeletal shape and size of remains. Furthermore, unique characteristics such as congenital malformation or acquired physical defects which could have been known to the relatives or friends of a missing person are recorded for future comparison. Positive identification based on anthropological profile can be achieved only if specific individualizing feature like sign of previously documented medical intervention or unique anatomical characteristics are found. Nevertheless, exclusion of identity can be easily accomplished if the anti-mortem information is contradicted by profile of the remains. Many of the indicators of sex and race and are the age dependent. In mass disaster cases, when the task is at hand is to match unidentified remains against vast amount of data regarding the missing person, age is a crucial factor in the preliminary screening procedures. Indeed, separating the remains into distinct age groups can save valuable time during the comparison of anti-mortem and post-mortem records. This Adverb can be accomplished by correlating dental development and epiphyseal closure with the biological age of individuals that have not reached maturity or by linking degenerative changes of various synotosis with age. While dental age estimation in children and sub-adults is highly accurate, it provides the limited indication of age in adults. Attrition, which have been suggested as an indicator of age, is highly influenced by diet, habits, health and hygiene. Thus, at best visual dental examination can determine only if the individual had reached the maturity.
establishing the gender of the remains is critical step as it eliminates all members of opposite sex in the anti-mortem data bank thus reducing the number of comparison to be performed furthermore the ensuring estimation of biological age and stature depend on the correct determination of sex as the standard are gender specific there is ongoing debate among physical anthropologists concerning the subdivision of humans into distinct racial groups the basis for this controversy stems from the national repugnance of enlightened scientists to the atrocities perpetrated throughout history in the name of racial cleansing nevertheless physical difference among population are an important contribution to the process of data bank screening and personal identification in forensic anthropology especially in mass disasters when minimizing the amount of search is imperative the division of human population into biological races that is mongoloid negroids casquoids astroids and phalanicians tends to be arbitrary to some degree racial identification is often complex in addition to the very wide range of variation within each racial group and considerable overlap between the numbers of different races many individuals bears the genes of two or more racial groups Furthermore, most official records concerning the estimation of stature is a routine practice in the creation of anthropological profile. The task might be accomplished by measuring the various complete or fragmented long bones and vertebral segments and then implementing regression formulae that are sex and population specific. the application of regression equations as with the regression formula requires experience in osteology understanding both normal skeletal anatomy as well as possible pathological or normal variation can greatly increase the accuracy of the diagnosis of traumatic lesions such as patent blunt injuries gunshot wounds sharp injuries and the presence of heel and unheel fractures thus ruling out the natural taponomic phenomena now let us learn about individualizing characteristics heel fractures pathological and degenerative changes as well as souvenirs in the skeleton are excellent markers for positive identification of human remains once the anthropological profile has limited the search of the mass casualties database to a few anti mortem records old surgical procedures as well as prosthetic devices are in invaluable for personal identification often at times comparison of anti mortem and post mortem radiographs albeit not indicating any pathological condition can still prove worthwhile in the process of identification by comparing the tubercular bone pattern unique to each individual thus in mass disaster radiographic screening of all the victims is very important now let us see the factors of individualization even after general group affinities and demorphographic characteristic have been determined the forensic anthropologist must then attempt to find traits that are peculiar to one individual in the living one may observe distinctive feature such as fingerprints scars tattoos an unusually large nose protruding ears a limb lost limbs missing or broken teeth etc in the skeleton the individual anomalies can range from evidence of surgical intervention such as steel pin to repair a broken bone or a wire sutures in the sternum resulting from heart surgery the degree of healing can reveal if days weeks or years have passed since the operation the presence of dental work is very helpful if a person was treated by a dentist the comparison can be made with the dental records of missing person it is also possible to match distinctive features on anti mortem and post mortem x ray 
A number of diseases leave their traces in the skeleton. Primary bone cancers and advanced metastatic tumors, example osteosacroma, multiple myocoma, from characteristic lessons as may infectious disease, example osteomyelitis, magnetis, tertiary syphilis, leprosy, and tuberculosis. Disorders such as Peggitt's disease, rickets, achondroplasia, anemia, and arthritis can cause mild to severe deformation. Trauma can also be identified. A broken nose that heal asymmetrical, a non-fatal bullet launched in the skull, calicious formation of following a fracture, a relative might remember a certain injuries and a doctor or a hospital may have x-ray to compare with the remains. Bones can marked with recognizable use pattern that may indicate headness and occupational stresses. A right-handed professional patient or a tennis player would exhibit a greater degree of differential wear along with the evidence of disproportionate muscle development on the side. Baseball pitching has also been associated with the presence of bony spicules on the ulnar notch. Distinctive formulation have been linked to the numerous occupational and activities for which they were named as milker's neck, cowboy thumb, stream stress finger, miner's knee, weaver's bottom to a few names. Thus, in case of mass disaster, forensic anthropologists study these individual characteristics to determine whether the remains found are of human or non-human origin. Now, let us learn about distinguishing human and non-human remains. Distinguishing between human and non-human bone is a task that should only be undertaken by a forensic anthropologist or an individuals experienced in the osteology. There are several questions that the experienced forensic anthropologist should be able to answer in this field. This includes determining whether the suspected material is actually bone and if it is bone, it is of human or non-human. For example, rocks will appear in shapes that can mimic human bones. One rule of thumb is that rocks are usually heavier than bone. The irregular bone that could be mistaken for rocks such as the patella, carpus that is the wrist bone or tarsus, ankle bones tend to have a higher concentration of trabecular or calicinous bone making them significantly lighter than the rocks. An experienced forensic anthropologist will have no problem in distinguishing between the non-osseous material from the bone. Now, let us see the identification of victims of mass disaster. First is facial imaging. If the search is narrowed to a few possible individuals, their photographs may be compared to the remains. This procedure is known as a skull to photo superimposition. If no known missing person files the description, the only option is to attempt facial reconstruction. The difficult task of recreating appearance during life form, the features of skull. Though not an exact science, the resemblance is sometimes close enough to facilitate the identification. Establishing identity is not limited to skeletal remains. It is becoming increasingly important to able to determine if two or more photographs depict the same individual. Photo to photo comparison entitles the comparison of photographic images taken at different times under different conditions. This relatively new type of analysis relies on both metric and morphological assessment and comparison of facial feature. Next we have is the dental implants as means of identification. As with the dental restoration, surgical procedures may also require the implantation of materials in the body that may be of assistance in the identification of remains. The usefulness of orthopedic devices due to manufacturer logo and means of tracking this device to a specific patient through unique serial and lot number has been documented.
as likely a source of information for positively identifying associated human remains. Pacemaker have been commonly traced implants in the identification of remains. Although there are many forms of implants, one would have to consider the likelihood of survival of such implants in cremation context. Fixative devices like screws and surgical plates are ideal candidates for examination in cremains. However, even more complicated devices such as an osteostimulator, an implanted device that is used to induce the regeneration of bone tissue by means of stimulating electrical current have been of assistance in the identification of cremation. All material that are directly associated with human remains that can possibly be a component of an implanted device must be explained in the analysis of recovered materials. The challenge is to recognize these cremated components from amongst other fire alterated materials associated with or around the human cremated materials. Now let us learn about ABO blood typing. Determining the ABO blood group from a sample of a fresh blood or from a dried stain is a common procedure. Along with other evidences, blood stain analysis may be used to place a person at a crime scene or possibly to completely exclude the person. To a large extent, DNA extraction technology has superseded the reliance on the ABA blood system for identification. Normally, this kind of testing is totally within the preview of crime scene laboratory. A variation of blood testing, however, is related to forensic anthropology called the absorption illusion technique. These ABO blood group determination have been conducted on samples of hair, bone, fingernail with some sources. Dr. Shiyoshi Yata used this technique on forensic cases and archaeological remains. His work demonstrated that even dry bone and small amount of hair can yield ABO identification. In middle of 1970, Robert Pickering and other tested the absorption illusion technique and applied it to the American remains from the Southeast Asia with some success. The results showed that even hair as short as 2 cm could be used successfully. Forensic toxicologist also can determine blood type from skeletal remains. Determining the blood type is useful as a means of eliminating a large number of persons. If the skeletal remains are discovered to be form of an individual with type O blood, then all people with type A, B or AB blood group are eliminated. However, blood typing or paleoserology sometimes yields a false positive or false negative result. So, it should not be relied on as sole indicator of the identification. For instances, certain plants can cause false positive results on remains that have been buried in the ground. Therefore, in addition to testing the human sample, it is necessary to also know about the plants in the immediate vicinity of the remains and possibly do the ABO test on the soil. Now, let us see about DNA. The ultimate individualizer is DNA, everyone's unique genetic code. In the absence of blood or soft tissue, DNA can sometimes be extracted from the bone. However, like fingerprinting, there must be a record of the victim's DNA profile for comparison to make a positive identification. If there is no record, the DNA can be compared with that of the close relative but this can only rule out possibility of kinship. Most recently, the use of DNA on a wide scale has been used to assist establishing the identification of highly fragmented remains. Example, McNinon and Mudroff in 2007. Dental analysis in combination with dental, anthropological and pathological analysis will continue to be used in mass disaster fertility incident. Now let us summarize what we have learned in this module. A mass disaster is usually recognized as any event in which there is a sudden occurrence of large number of deceased individuals. 
One of the most challenging aspect of mass disaster scene processing is the coordination of resources in an efficient manner. The identification of human remains from mass fatalities is largely accomplished using the dental remains. It is clear from the foregoing that the condition of remains in mass disaster scenarios is of paramount importance to identification process. The anthropologist focuses on identifying anatomical structures, unique in visualizing features and pathological finding in osseous remains. Developing an anthropological profile entails estimation of age, sex, ancestry that is the race stratum of a particular individual though the interpretation of skeletal shape and size of the remains. Distinguishing between human and non-human bone is a task that should be only be undertaken by a forensic anthropologist or individual experienced in osteology.